and it's available at northpark.edu slash live. And then following the symposium, uh, we are all invited to a reception over in the Johnson Center on the second floor on the Peterson balcony. Um, so this symposium, just to give you the structure, will have a dynamic plenary talk followed by brief responses from our three respondents, and then we will take questions. Now, how will we take questions? You'll see on your chairs that you have note cards. So at any time you have a question, go ahead and write it down, pass it outward. There'll be students uh, looking for the chance to collect those. We'll sort through them and we'll be able to ask at least some of those questions to our speaker and to our panelists. Well, let me introduce our speaker. Um, you have a fairly extensive description. I want to write and say just a little bit different here. So first of all, Dr. Kathy Eden currently serves as professor of sociology and public affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. She's written several award-winning books, books that have altered our understanding of urban poverty and families. Um, one of her most recent books, $2 a Day, Living on Almost Nothing in America, was met with uh, national critical acclaim. In fact, it was included in the New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2015. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of books published each year. So to be selected in the top 100, that's quite something. Dr. Eden is among a very select number of scholars in our nation who is part of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Um, in common speak, Dr. Eden is a big shot. Yeah. But I want you also to know that a bit about her and her path, because Dr. Eden is truly one of us. She started here. She got her bachelor's degree here in sociology. She then went on and earned her master's and PhD at Northwestern University, a little school up the road. And she returned for her first few years to teach as a professor right here at North Park. She had a daughter graduate, uh, we think, what, four years ago from North Park. Her parents went here. She told me she had an uncle here back in the 1930s. Uh, and she currently serves on our board of trustees. In fact, this is her second five-year service, so we're really grateful. I would say that uh, one of the reasons that we so wanted her to be able to speak is that she oozes in her very life and her pores, what we say we care about at North Park. She's clearly dedicated her life to serving God and others by using her gifts of scholarship and teaching to influence the world to be a better place, to honor her God, Christ, and to make the world that much better. We were just talking, and she is now embarking on what we think is the largest ever qualitative study in the, in, the, in the U.S., a multi-million dollar project looking at issues of poverty throughout thousands of communities in the U.S. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathy Eden. So I've already learned a few things uh, today. Uh, one is that it's way more nerve-wracking having your parents watch you on live stream than uh, addressing Congress. Uh, second, uh, at Princeton we don't cry a lot, and I have now cried nine times, and counting. Uh, if, that goss if that worship team comes up one more time, it's over. In 1950, 30%, about a third of the world's population, was urban. Now, by about 2008, that figure surpassed 50%. Last year, 55% of the world's population lived in cities. And by 2050, about two-thirds of all of our citizens across the globe will live in cities. Now, the 20th century has been called the urban century. So what of the 21st century? It's an age where everywhere, all across the globe, the influence of the city will be felt. 
Now, in his book, Triumph of the City, uh, Harvard economist Ed Glazer heralds the city as our species' greatest invention. And he shows how it lifted human achievements to heights that would not have been possible without urbanizations. And this is believable, right? Cities are our seats of government. Cities are the locations of our great cultural institutions. Most institutes of higher learning, uh, not true of Princeton, but true of North Park, are in cities. And many of the marvels of modern architecture are in cities as well. So industrialization was really key in the history of cities because it transformed them from edifices of protection, uh, safety, uh, and protecting and controlling routes of uh, transportation and trade to places that concentrated labor and capital in amazing ways that allowed for unparalleled economic growth. But as you know, the industrialized city was also a magnet for poor immigrants from Europe and migrants from other parts of the United States. Now, some of these immigrants were uh, pushed by crop failure and poor harvests, uh, such as my ancestors from Sweden. Others, uh, by untenable social conditions, which prompted scores of African Americans to come north uh, during uh, the Great Migration to what was thought of uh, as the Promised Land. Uh, and by revolution, and by the pull of industrial jobs, as was the case for scores of Mexicans and later Mexican-Americans as Chicago drew them east. So this is a very famous map uh, among sociologists. This is from the early sociologist, early 20th century uh, sociologist Robert Park and er uh, Ernest Burgess. Their work observed a massive influx of immigrants coming into the city of Chicago at the turn of the century. And what they did was to describe how the city metabolized cascades of newcomers, segregating them, perniciously, persistently segregating them by race and ethnicity. So you see on this map, uh, the Italians are sorted into Little Italy, the Germans to Deutschland the Chinese to Chinatown, and African Americans increasingly to that corridor along South State Street that became known as the Black Belt. The city also segregated newcomers and old timers by income. So as you can see on this map, uh, closest to the city center uh, were the poorest citizens uh, who were relegated to uh, what, what Ernest, uh, Park, Ernest uh, Burgess and Robert Park called uh, the, the ghetto, the underworld, the rumors district. Uh, those a little bit better off moved outward to claim uh, the two flats, and those who were even better off, uh, the bungalows and single-family homes. As Harvey Zorba, one of uh, the founders of what's known as the Chicago School of Sociology, observed in 1929 in this book, uh, the loop that center of the map you just saw contained both the central business district but also the most affluent residents of the city, hence the name the Gold Coast. But this Gold Coast was cheek to jowl with the slum. Now what the work of all of these early 20th century sociologists hinted at was a deep tragedy that despite Edward Glazer's prose, has proven to be as endemic to cities as the triumphs Glazer describes. So industrialized cities and now post-industrialized cities, which by their nature attract unparalleled diversity, are often deeply segregated by ethnicity, by race, and by class. And of course, Chicago has been a poster child for these trends. So early industrial cities like Chicago often oppressed their workers. They often relegated them to squalid living conditions. So one feature of industrial cities is that they're often the scenes of intense class conflicts, such as the 1888 Haymarket riot, one of the most important riots in labor history, either here or in the world, all starting uh, for a, when a few marchers uh, coalesced in support of workers who are striking for an eight-hour day. 
Racial conflict has also been endemic to cities, such as the Chicago race riot of 1990, the worst of the red summer riots that swept the country. In Chicago, 38 people died and 500 were, in, uh, were injured. So what started this riot? Well, uh, an African-American boy was swimming in Lake Michigan and he accidentally drifted down the river uh, the lake into an area uh, that was informally designated whites only. So white youth began lobbing rocks at this swimmer until he drowned. And the riot resulted from African Americans rising up in protest against this violent act. Student-led protests are also features of industrialized cities such as the student protest movements uh, opposing the Vietnam War, which of course disrupted the 1968 Democratic National Convention, also held in Chicago. So by the mid-20th century, the work of urbanists reflected both these themes of triumph and tragedy. Uh, perhaps the best known Jane Jacobs, of course, wrote The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and she found real hope in the diversity of cities. But on the other hand, Lewis Mumford uh, believed that cities were doomed to death if they didn't begin to organize themselves around people rather than machines. Now, as an aside, I just read an amazing new book about cities that have managed to do just this. It's by our provost. It's called Market Cities, People Cities, and it tells the story of cities that have organized themselves around human needs. And I want to quote Michael briefly. He says, market cities end up with higher social inequality and more segregation and higher crime than people cities. People cities, on the other hand, have higher trust among their people, more civic participation than market cities. So pick that book up. You can get out your Amazon accounts right now. Now, when I was a graduate student, I became captivated by the work of a French sociologist and sometimes theologian uh, named Jacques Ellul. I used to carry Marx in one pocket, Weber in the other pocket, and uh, whichever was heavier, I would slip Jacques Ellul in to, to, as ballast against the winds coming off Lake Michigan. Uh, one of his master works, The Meaning of the City, really captured this tension better than any other. But it also offered a biblical diagnosis of the, pro of the problem and a prophetic cure. So I also have to say, uh, my husband wanted me to put this in, that the book has perhaps the best first line of any uh, uh, urban sociology book that I've ever read. Uh, here's how it starts. The first builder of a city was Cain. The circumstances were these. So you might be asking, what are these circumstances? Well, according to scripture, uh, Alul recounts, Cain built the first city after he murdered his brother and was cast out, cursed to wonder. But he was marked with a symbol of God's protection, and he was promised that God would offer him protection and security. But Cain chose to go his own way, and instead of relying on God's promise of security, he created his own uh, by building the first city. The city was a sign of his rebellion. And in keeping with this, uh, Alul reminds us that the famous early cities, Babylon, Babel, Nineveh, were all known for their rebellion. I felt the tragedy of the city viscerally when I first came to North Park in 1980 as a freshman. Now, North Park had just decided to stay in the city. So imagine what its president and board members must have felt when in uh, the spring of 1981, in March, uh, there were a series of violent incidents on the north side of Chicago uh, in the Cabrini-Green area. Uh, by the way, that's the first area where Swedes migrated into Chicago way back when. Uh, the violence was so severe that 38, 38 people had been shot, sorry, 37 people and 11 had died. And Jane Byrne, who, by the way, since we're celebrating women's leadership, uh, was the first woman mayor of any, any major U.S. city, she decided to move in uh, to Cabrini Green with her husband. That's Cabrini Green right there. It's about how it looked when I first started hanging out there in 1981, and that's the mayor. 
This is her first night in her new apartment where she's having home a dinner uh, with her husband. Uh, she only lasted at Cabrini for three weeks. So there's that. But also in 1980, by the time I got to North Park, uh, the census had just been administered. And this census revealed something extraordinary. It revealed that there was a historically high and rapidly growing trend in the city that posed a very, very pernicious and unique threat. That was the growth of concentrated poverty. Uh, that's defined as neighborhoods in which at least 40% of your neighbors are poor. So just since the 70s, uh, what these maps show is a dramatic increase in the number of neighborhoods uh, who, that were extremely poor. Uh, the, the, the maker of this map is the famous sociologist William Julius Wilson, and this is from his book, uh, The Truly Disadvantaged. But in just a decade's time, uh, one's probability of being poor and living in a hyper-segregated neighborhood had increased dramatically. And importantly, Wilson argued that it was the rise of this extreme segregation in cities by income layered onto the historic pattern of racial segregation, which explained why the war on poverty had not been won. So these hyper-segregated neighborhoods did not occur by accident. The Chicago Housing Authority had chosen to cite massive high-rise projects in the historic Black Belt you just saw on Zorba's map, hugging, again, that State Street quarter, closed off from the rest of the city uh, by uh, the L, by the Dan Ryan Expressway, and by other, uh, other barriers, uh, physical and legal, such as restrictive cover, uh, covenants. To cross these boundaries meant that one risked one's life. Quickly, uh, this is actually um, the Robert Taylor Homes and several other uh, public housing uh, uh, communities uh, on the south side when they were built and completed in 1962. Uh, this was the largest uh, cluster of public housing in the world. Uh, and you can see that although they look shiny and new in this picture, they, they quickly became corridors of poverty and despair. Uh, in 1982, facilitated by David Clairbout, a sociology professor here at North Park, I began an internship in this neighborhood just after uh, Jane Burns' historic tenancy there. And while I was there, I met April Grant. She was an elementary school student, and she was being tutored by North Park students after school. April introduced me to her mother, Sonia. And it was amazing to me how instantly I fe felt an affinity uh, with Sonia. Uh, she was a small town gal from Mississippi. I was a small town kid from Minnesota. Neither one of us had more than one stoplight in our, in our hometowns. And we both felt the city to be sort of an alienating and, and strange place. And, and what was interesting about that relationship is, looking back now, I realize that was really a turning point in my life and, and probably charted the rest of my career. So soon after, when I was a graduate student at Northwestern, I needed to moonlight to make extra money. And I took on a part-time uh, teaching job with the North Park uh, pr program that offered uh, college classes in some of the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in the city. So I found myself uh, spending afternoons in uh, South Lawn, uh, North Lawndale, excuse me, teaching sociology courses. Uh, my very first assignment was to teach minority cultures. And of course, I was the only non-minority in the room. Uh, very interesting. North Lando, by the way, is another one of these hyper-segregated neighborhoods that William Julius Wilson wrote about. And in fact, it was the poorest neighborhood in Chicago at that time. Uh, there I met wonderful students, including Shirley Garcia, North Park students, R Rita Teague, uh, Valerie Gabray, who taught me so much more than I taught them, more about what it was like to live in places of hyper-segregation and try to raise a family, and what it was like trying to subsist on welfare while raising their families and attempting to improve their educational prospects and their human capital. And it was these relationships that undergirded my first major book with Laura Lane, Making Ends Meet. Later, as a professor, I got several research grants to follow a group of families that had managed to escape the vertical ghettos that I just showed you. Due to a landmark Supreme Court decision, Gautreaux 
uh, et al. Uh, v. Chicago Housing Authority. Uh, Dorothy Gautreaux, the main plaintiff, had been a, a resident of uh, Altgeld Gardens, and civil rights attorney Alex Polakoff fr from Chicago uh, led uh, the effort over the years with this suit. This suit charged that by concentrating more than 100,000 almost completely African-American public, uh, public housing residents in segregated black neighborhoods, the CHA and HUD had violated both the U.S. Constitution and the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So both were found guilty of discriminatory housing projects. So one remedy uh, the CHA was required uh, to, uh, to uh, implement was to offer a portion of its residents the chance to move to a less segregated neighborhood through a voucher. So the early results of this program were so uh, successful, so promising, that HUD soon follows suit with a national program called Moving to Opportunity. And I got to follow these families, and, and when I first interviewed them, I asked each of them, what was it like living in these hyper-segregated areas? One told me, I felt like it was a mistake. Somebody dropped me off and didn't come back to pick me up. It was torture. It was sometimes like a bad dream. The elevators was always broke. You had to walk 13 flights of steps. My kids couldn't go downstairs to the playground with the other kids when the elevator was broke because people would get to shooting down there and I couldn't come running down 13 flights of steps to save them. Another told me, and this quote just sticks with me, uh, that was the worst experience I ever experienced. Living in an environment which made you feel trapped, caged, and worthless, just stuck into the atmosphere of absolutely no progress. It was a whole little community of pure dissatisfaction in everything. No one encouraged no one. I became stabilized in my depression. I knew I could not do anything as long as I was trapped in that situation. So Alola, in the meaning of the city, conceded that the city was indeed the most significant creation of humankind. Yet he insisted that it still carried with it a tragic legacy. For Alola, the city remained Babel a site of rebellion against God. But that is not where his exegesis ended. In the New Testament, Jerusalem represents both the city's persistent distress and the city's eventual restoration. Here I'm quoting from a little scholar, Noah Tolley of Wheaton College. Despite the fact that it was born out of rebellion, God still promises to eventually redeem the city. All cities. This promise will only be fully realized in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. But meantime, uh, we as Christians find ourselves in this uncomfortable yet very familiar place. The now but not yet. So does this mean we should flee the city? Does this mean we should turn our backs on its despair? Uh, to this question, Alul says a resounding no. While we wait in this period of now but not yet, we are, without question, called to live and work in the city. In fact, it is vital that we do so because Christians in the city represent the presence of God in the midst of self-assertion, of self-realization, and the self-sufficiency of human beings. Again, according to a Lowell scholar, Noah Tolley. Our presence in the city is vital because we must, through our lives and our actions, symbol, signif uh, symbolize what the kingdom is like. So a little warns that it's not going to come without suffering. We may fail, but there will still be miracles along the way as we try to represent the kingdom by seeking justice and mercy for the city. Now I'm going to show you something really miraculous, okay? I'm going to show you a, a 
century of census data, don't yawn, it's really going to be exciting, from the city of Chicago. And what I'm going to show you is an evolving portrait of the growing racial and ethnic divides in this city, but with some notable exceptions. So we're going to start in 1910. The city is overwhelmingly white, save uh, emerging non-white populations on the near nose side and its neighbors. But still, these neighborhoods remained 60% white. In 1920, we see the consolidation and spread of this area moving southward as the city's historic black belt begins to form. Now, 1930 and 40 show the consolidation of the city's black belt. By 1930, uh, many of these neighborhoods are 80% African American, a dramatic change from just a decade before. And in 1940, that figure is 90% in many of these neighborhoods. In 1950, the Black Belt is bursting at its seams with overpopulation. The Great Migration has brought scores of African Americans to the city. That number would reach a uh, half a million by 1970, but these migrants were restricted to this little bit of land hugging a 30-block corridor on South Street, State Street, hemmed in by social custom, restrictive covenants, uh, physical barriers, and met with violence when people tried uh, to, to, to cross that barrier. In 1960, for the first time, we see the emergence of multiple neighborhoods, those are the ones in bright purple, with no majority population. But don't get too excited, because these neighborhoods were all in the process of rapid racial turnover, as period, people of European descent were replaced by African American, Mexican, and Chinese newcomers. So by 1970, the city is divided. Non-whites are segregated into a south and west side corridor, while whites hold the north and southwest sides. But now, racial turnover is in full flight as whites flee the city. Nineteen eighty. This is when the Ladina majority neighborhoods emerge. Here we see Pilsen and South Lawndale, already eighty percent Latino, and they're joined by Logan Square and its neighbors by nineteen ninety. These patterns of segregation continue into two thousand, but. Now, there is a plethora of neighborhoods in bright purple, neighborhoods where there is no majority population, including this little area, Community Area 14, circled Albany Park. So since it began to diversify, Albany Park has largely resisted the segregating impulses of the city and the process of rapid racial turnover. As a result, Albany Park looks like Chicago. So we're a little less white than on average for the city. We're a little more Hispanic. We're less black. We're more Asian. But all the major racial and ethnic groups are here in this neighborhood. Entering into the 21st century, Albany Park st stands as one of the five most diverse using a multi-factor uh, index of of diversity, both by race and by class, and it is the city's most diverse ethnic neighborhood. According to a 2008 DePaul report, half of its residents are foreign-born, hailing from five countries, with children speaking 40 different languages. Many of you know this, but I ask you, what are the chances? You know, what are the chances that a university built on farmland in 1894, on the outskirts of a burgeoning city, would find itself more than a century later at ground zero in a place where people from such varied backgrounds are living together, brushing shoulders, sometimes bridging cultural divides. Is this an accident? Or is it divine provenance? Does this 
smell, feel, taste, a little like the kingdom? Lest you think that neighborhoods that resist segregation are unimportant, I want to take you back to those families I met, families that had this opportunity, this rare opportunity to escape uh, those horizontal ghettos. I was among a team of researchers who followed these families for 15 years to find out how they fared. Now, they moved to various places, but they ended up in average neighborhoods. Neighborhoods like Albany Park, they move from hyper-segregated neighborhoods to average neighborhoods, neighborhoods that look like the city. So we uh, started following them in the, er, the mid-1990s, but went back and interviewed them in 2002, then again in 2007, again in 2010, and followed some through uh, 2013. This is the cover of uh, my book uh, on the story of these families. Uh, and, and in 2010, uh, by 2010, most of the young people, the children who had been born in public housing, who we'd been following, uh, were entering late adolescence and early adulthood. After us, other researchers, some, a team of economists, used IRS data to follow these children even further into their middle 20s. So what did inje injecting just a little justice just a little justice into the lives of these families accomplish. Families who, due to their largely segregated lives, have seen far more tragedy of the city uh, than triumph. So what our study showed is that youth in these families were two and a half times more likely to graduate than high school than their parents had, and roughly four times more likely to enroll in college or trade school. At study's end, 82% were what we called on track, either working or in school. And only 18%, uh, 27 of the 150 kids we followed, had ever been involved in serious drug selling or other kinds of crime. So what we witnessed is a huge intergenerational leap forward. Now, uh, as we began to interview these young people and figure out what distinguished those who stayed on track from those who stumbled, we found that a key factor, the key factor, was whether a young person in adolescence would grab hold of what we called an identity project, some passion they could be about that would bridge uh, the, the gap between their current circumstances and their their future aspirations. Now, the most effective of these identity projects involved adult mentors. Uh, North Park's Urban Outreach provides such mentors by participating in after-school tutoring, as Donna uh, Harris mentioned, at el elementary schools actually all over the city of Chicago, and by volunteering uh, at Young Life at Lane Tech. Now, I told you there was a team of economists that followed these young people even further into their mid-20s, and here, uh, the story is truly astonishing. Those offered the opportunity to move with a voucher relative to those who didn't saw a third more income. A third more income. You know, I used to teach, and I actually still teach a course at Harvard. Um, now I'm teaching at Princeton called uh, Sociology of Poverty, and the students used to joke that the course was, should be titled Nothing Works. Uh, because the average result of any anti-poverty intervention is zero. So, I mean, this is big. This is really big. A third more income, a third more college going, the quality of the colleges they intended improve, and there was a 27% reduction in single motherhood. So just a little bit of justice, a merciful relief from hyper-segregation meant so much to these young people. And I believe this is powerful evidence that efforts to bring justice and mercy to the city can bear fruit. Okay, so earlier I reminded you of the miracle of North Park ending up at ground zero, this archetypal neighborhood for diversity. But, but I often smell, taste, and feel the kingdom of God in this place for another reason. Okay, so I'm not the first to do so today, but I want you to close your eyes. No peeking. So this fall, I was sitting at the Johnson Center uh, Bickner Bistro. I was waiting for a board of trustees meeting to start. And you know, outside the window is that crossroads uh, with that plaque in the center, that brick circle 
Um, and, and abounding that circle are low walls, low brick walls bowing out, lettered with the words uh, that we all know, seek justice, love mercy, walk with God. I kind of believe that if the prophet Micah were here today with us, just maybe he would have added in the city. So there I am, and I, I lift my eyes to the foot traffic traversing the circle. I see women and men. I see a cornucopia of diversity by ethnicity, race. I see future pastors, nurses, physicians, educators, historians, business people, engineers, musicians, artists, public servants, maybe even some future sociologists. They're all together. They're rubbing shoulders. They're nodding and they're laughing. Uh, now I want you to open your eyes so I can show you this scene. You may think this is normal if you hang around this place a lot but it's not. These students learn together. They live together. They compete together, perform together, serve together. They travel to the city every Wednesday to that wonderful living lab laboratory together. They pray together. They worship together. And now, thanks to visionary leadership at the seminary, they include both incarcerated and free students. We don't do it perfectly. Those of us on the board know that not all of our students experience North Park in the same way, not by a long shot. We have urgent work to do, but in one of the most segregated cities in the nation, in the most economically segregated time in our history as a nation. This, in itself, is the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem breaking through. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, that uh, we are encouraged and we are grateful indeed. You give us a lot to think about, and we're going to start thinking about it right now. So while I introduce our panelists, if they would come on up, take their seats, um, we'll give them each a chance to give a response to Dr. Eden's talk. So Dr. Michelle Clifton Sodestrom is a professor of theology and ethics here at the seminary. She's also founder of the Statesville program at the Statesville Prison, where students, both on the inside and the outside, can earn a Master of Arts in Christian Ministry. She's the author of multiple books and scholarly articles. And one of my favorite things, she's a co-writer of a film narrated by Dr. Timothy Johnson called God's Glory and Neighbor's Good, The Story of Pietism. Riveting. <laughs> yes. Reverend Dr. Rich Kong is a uh, our director of civic engagement and our catalyst hub here at North Park. Uh, he does uh, work quietly behind the scenes in many ways, but he does an amazing job interfacing our university with the entirety of our city. He's working on something very amazing when it comes to fruition, we'll announce it, but uh, something involving working with the city and the faith communities throughout Chicago. So we're very grateful that you agreed to be with us. Yeah. And then Dr. Gwendolyn Purifoy, Poy, Purifoy, yes, I'm learning how to pronounce in the French way. Assistant Professor of Sociology here at North Park. Uh, she's been with us for a couple of years. I was so excited that we were able to hire her. She's an urban specialist, and she does things like ride public transportation over and over and over again, noting how does it change, what happens when you're on the north side versus the south side. How do the buses change? You have different kinds of buses on the different sides. What do the stations look like? And she's noting the 
the, the, the way that public transportation and racial inequality are often intertwined. Uh, and that's just one of the many projects she's working on. So thank you for being here as well. Okay, so we, our responses will go in the order that is in the uh, brochure, the schedule. So, Michelle? I'm sure I speak for the entire room when I say thank you, Dr. Eden, for your scholarship, for your service to this institution, and for your passion for the kingdom, your gift to us all. I'd like to direct my remarks this afternoon um, to the work that I think Dr. Eden is calling us to. And it's a work that challenges North Park's core values of being Christian, of being city-centered, and being intercultural. At this time in our history, I suggest to you that we could challenge ourselves to continue to mature in the area of what it means to be intercultural. What does it mean for North Park to live into its intercultural core value? Angela Davis argues that there's a significant difference between multiculturalism and justice, and particularly racial justice. It would be very easy and tempting for us to believe that because we are diverse, we have overcome or at least come to terms with racism. But multiculturalism at its core is not simply diverse representation or a bouquet of flowers or a beautiful mosaic or even hitting the tipping point of over 50% non-majority culture students on our campus. Multiculturalism is not a metaphor, nor is it a number. At its best, and I believe this is deeply Christian and it is deeply city-centered, multiculturalism is the creation of spaces where the cross-cultural community comes together, names oppression, fights for justice, and addresses structural inequalities like Dr. Eden's talked about in her paper and in her research. And we do it together. Multiculturalism at its best is the space to resist something and also to build something. Dr. Eden's work specifically calls us to the work of resisting segregation because segregation is not good for the city and more accurately to use Provost Emerson's language, it is not good for the people in the city. The description of hypersegregation from those who lived in the Chicago housing projects are haunting and they give us vivid descriptions of why segregation is not good for people. It was torture like a bad dream, living in an environment that made you feel trapped, caged, and worthless. It was pure dissatisfaction in everything. And finally, I knew I could not do anything as long as I was trapped in that situation. Social psychologist Thomas Pettigrew argues that hypersegregation is the structural linchpin of American race relations. Rising poverty over the last 40 years in black neighborhoods in particular corresponds with harsh and disadvantaged social environments. These spatially concentrated areas of disadvantage in our city of Chicago show us that our intercultural core value work toward racial justice is ahead of us. I'll give you an example. Chicago is often described as a city of neighborhoods. But in all the studies that I've read and the maps that I've looked at that mark out the different wards and district in the city, none include Stateville Correctional Center. So as most of you know, Stateville Correctional Center is a maximum security prison in Crest Hill, and you're probably thinking, well, that's because Stateville isn't in the city proper. But a bit of background about Stateville might have you change your mind. Approximately 60% of those at Stateville are black even though they comprise 14% of the state's population. 30% are white, and 12% are Hispanic or Latino. Further, the prison population in the state of Illinois has grown from 6,000 in the mid-70s to the number that it is today, which is 49,000 people. Finally, the majority of persons in Stateville Correctional Center are from Chicago's west and south side neighborhoods. 
So at a time in history when we are seeking and experience a marked increase in integrated neighborhoods in our city, we have relocated people from Chicago's Black Belt to Stateville. And Stateville is arguably one of Chicago's most segregated neighborhoods. North Park, as ground zero, is strategically situated to resist things like segregation. We're not only strategically situated to resist, however. We are also positioned to build something. After all, that's what cities do are all about. And here is why that's good news for us. The kingdom of God allows us to do something that good intentions, the best intentions in the city alone cannot. The kingdom of God allows us to transcend the spatial limitations of Albany Park and even the city. We are resisting segregation in Stateville by building educational programming in prison with outside North Parkers. And as you know, probably, the seminary has started a degree-seeking program. We enrolled 38 incarcerated students um, who will earn master's degree last fall, and we have 15 or so visiting students who are incarcerated. And what is happening on our Stateville campus is not just a seminary program. Undergraduates come in and take courses for credit. Our writing center has offered support and partnership. In fact, our director is there today teaching 15 incarcerated students to become writing assistants under the direction of North Park's writing center. The gospel choir has been going in and out for four years. Over the last four years, we have had over 300 free North Parkers, from students to board members to major donors to Evangelical Covenant Church representatives, go to our Stateville campus. By blurring the lines between the Albany Park neighborhood and the Stateville neighborhood, North Park is actively resisting segregation in this city. If we're going to build education that is truly Christian, that is truly city-centered, we must embrace our interculturalism as the space to live the struggle of inequalities together. And I believe the faith and learning community is the most significant place for this to happen. Dr. Eden's research in Coming of Age in the Other America and also in $2 a Day show definitively that youth who find an identity project, something to be about, a sustaining passion that forms a bridge between the challenges of the present and future aspirations has the power to interrupt the intergenerational transmission of disadvantage. And when it does, people's trajectories change dramatically for the better. Building through education means that everybody, not just those who have experienced more tragedy than triumph, find their identity project. And for those of us who have experienced more triumph than tragedy, our identity project looks different. Speaking for myself, when I frame the work that North Park is doing at Stateville, I make clear that it is not simply charity work or free education. It is North Park doing what it does best. Christian higher education in the city in the form of creative, Christ-like reparations. Hmm. A healing balm, to use Dr. Donna Harris's language from this morning's chapel. I believe that under the leadership of President Surridge and the work of our other leadership like Provost Emerson and Sheena Keith and Dean Kirsten, that North Park is strategically situated to do the urgent work that Dr. Eden is calling us into. President Surge prayed these words as part of the closing prayer at the seminary convocation last fall. And in her prayer, she said, on this day, we lift you, the hearts and minds and bodies and labors of all students at North Park this year. Before us today, we have the precious students who will seek your wisdom, guidance, and grace as seminarians studying on our local campus. And joining them in places from this sacred chapel and deeply held in our hearts, in places of freedom, in places of restraint, we seek your hand of safety and your gift of grace. For we know that education may grant us freedom and knows no restraint. You have called these students, and you will likewise equip them. President Surridge did not just pray this at Albany Park, as you see in the photo that's up there. 
she blurred the lines between the North Park and Albany Park neighborhoods and the Stateville neighborhood. While we have remained true to our Albany Park heritage of resisting segregation, we still have urgent work to do in the city, and we will know we can rest only when all of our brothers and sisters, in the words of Dr. Kathy Eden, learn together, live together, compete on the same teams, perform together, serve together, travel the city together, and pray and worship together. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for the powerful words. Doc, thank you, Dr. Eden, for being with us and for your words as well. I come from a pastoral background, so I'm just going to stay and just read straight through because we don't do well with 10 minutes, so <laughs> doing my best. In invoking Elul, Dr. Eden has offered a theological template for how one can understand and view the city. As we live between the now and not yet, Jesus' model prayer, let your kingdom come, implores God to bring glimpses of the eschatological heaven to infiltrate the earth in our cities. What should this look like? While we can look to the otherworldly, glimmering descriptions of the, new, of the New Jerusalem given in the book of Revelation, it is clear that scripture itself not only foreshadows the end of the age, but looks backwards to the very beginning of it all, the Garden of Eden. As Elul himself highlights, Eden symbolized perfect and complete security with God and with one another. Just as significantly, the author of Genesis highlights that the river that supplied Eden also branched off into four tributaries, two of which are known to us as the Tigris and Euphrates. Given the stature of the Tigris and Euphrates, the ancient listeners in an ancient tradition, and based on my theological speculations, perhaps the natural associations they would have made in their minds is to the burgeoning and flourishing civilizations cradled along its banks. In other words, the waters that supplied the garden were always meant to flow beyond paradise to extend its flourishing to all humanity. The river that flowed from Eden was never meant to be an unsustainable ebion in a bottle. <laughs> Eden had no boundaries, and the world would flourish in the same way. The boundaries only come after the fall, when Adam and Eve are told to leave. While the first inhabitants of the garden were told to vacate for their own good, we see that modern-day manifestations of boundaries are quite different. Dr. Eden compellingly described the detrimental effects of segregated public housing units in Baltimore and Chicago, and how residents' outcomes improved when they found new homes in neighborhoods like Albany Park. While the demolition of the projects is championed as a victory today, many are wary. Mm -hmm. Could the mechanisms that led to the rise of the high-rises in the first place be the same mechanisms at work in other manifestations, impacting the very communities they're relocated to? Is it possible these mechanisms are as old as Eden itself? There was a third river that branched out from the waters of Eden, the Pishon, which flowed into a region called Havilah, known for its gold deposits. Could this have been a subtle allusion to what would take place later in humanity? In a patriarchal world of conquest and domination, the tributaries that carry pristine waters from paradise can quickly become choked off and turned into a brackish swamp by greedy prospectors panning for gold. Today, Chicago shares a metaphorical parallel. As the city continued its rapid expansion through the late 1800s, Chicago faced an emerging public health crisis. The branches of the Chicago River flowed through the city out into Lake Michigan, the same river that enabled its rise as an economic powerhouse spewed toxic human industrial waste out into Lake Michigan, Chicago's main water source. The city literally choked on its own byproducts of economic growth and prosperity. The challenges of our city from urban violence to food deserts to segregated housing can be traced to a common phenomenon, in my opinion. The flow of our city's investments and resources continue to follow the same flow of the Chicago River down to the loop, where they're redirected at the whims of the movers and shakers on LaSalle Street and Wacker Drive. I pray and hope none of you work there. <laughs> like the flow from Eden to Havala. $55 million in TIF funds utilized for University Stadium near McCormick Place and the $6 billion redevelopment of Lincoln Yards into more office space and luxury apartments within steps of an already gentrified Lincoln Park? Outsiders and residents alike lament that we have gone from a city on the make to a city on the take. We're unabashedly a city of the market, and Eden is far upstream. 
While market cities can potentially bring more investment and jobs, our own Provost Emerson, and I'm not referencing this because he's my boss, <laughs> he writes in his latest work contrasting market cities and people cities, and he says this, market cities are the bigger polluters, have more inequality, more crime, less trust, extensive sprawl, and a host of other seemingly clear negatives, including gentrification. As real estate values continue to rise in the city, spurred on by development in the Loop, the South Loop, and West Loop, low-income residents who lived as renters in neighborhoods, trending upwards economically like the historic African-American community of Bronzeville or the Mexican-American community of Pilsen are being forced out. All the more disheartening because Dr. Eden's research reminds us that strong neighborhoods can serve as buffers for at-risk youth. From 1995 to 2008, the city tore down the Henry Horner homes on Lake Avenue west of Ashland. Purchasers of market rate units, predominantly white, were supposed to live next to those with Section 8 vouchers. Unfortunately, one resident I heard about described his current experience as Henry Horner flipped on its side, just a lot less of us here now. In Chicago, what are the implications if Section 8, or now housing choice vouchers as we call them, are simply the new restrictive housing covenants? Following the third tributary from Eden to the land of gold is not just apparent in market cities like Chicago. The same currents are at work in higher ed. It's expected we must compete with other institutions to build the poshest dorms and buildings with the most modern amenities to meet consumers, I mean students' needs. <laughs> Indeed, even in higher ed, we can now see that the flow travels down to the loop and meanders through the collaborative uni university venture in South Loop, where several universities partnered to build high-rise dorms that rival their neighbors to the tune of $201 million recently, of course, sold to a real estate investment firm. The costs are predictably being passed down to students. According to the Federal Reserve, for the second quarter of 2018, outstanding student loans hit $1.53 trillion. The gentrification of education is Lee Bassett once coined. According to Dr. Eden's research, one of the greatest barriers for upward mobility is a short-term calculus under-resourced young people must do under duress. Dollars in hand working a minimum wage job feels much more tangible than pursuing a four-year diploma that promises the possibility of a job. It certainly can't help if the calculus doesn't compute. As institutions tout increased diversity numbers from both a race and economic standpoint, higher education in the U.S. must now bear the same built of the developers who pushed the original inhabitants out. The rents are rising, and only those who can pay can stay. Lydia Dishman writes, according to a new survey from CareerBuilder, 27% of American companies are recruiting those who hold master's degrees for positions that used to only require four-year degrees. How many students from a low SES can afford to move on to grad school to compete for the same jobs that now require a master's degree di diploma when they're now $25,000 in debt obtaining their bachelor's? Amen, students? <laughs> So back up the river to North Park, what is our place in all of this? Do we feed in the same current? Or do we push towards something even more dramatic? In Chicago, we did the impossible and unthinkable. We reversed the river. Donald Miller notes that in 1885, after torrential downpours caused sewage to overflow and contaminate the city's water supply, there were deadly outbreaks of waterborne diseases that killed an estimated 12% of Chicago's population. It was not until almost every Chicagoan was touched by this public health crisis that people took to the streets. Public outrage moved legislators to action, and immigrants, including those likely from Sweden, were the ones who accepted the enormous challenge of dredging up a new canal inch by inch. The ecological impacts notwithstanding, Dr. Vic, I know you're here somewhere, and purely for the sake of analogy, Perhaps it's time we help reverse the flow. In some ways, we're already helping to reverse the flow. With a diverse student body across the socioeconomic spectrum, we offer a relatively affordable private education. Our students will leave with degrees obtained by studying under accomplished faculty in classrooms with small faculty to student ratios. We are making progress in helping them achieve their academic goals. Our first generation college students who come to North Park can participate in the Lighthouse program run by the Office of Student Success, which can translate much of the inside vernacular of higher ed, their parents never had the opportunity of nav navigating. And pedagogically, we are strategically poised to help students discern the flow of the river or to step foot into the waters through a dynamic core curriculum, our robust de degree programs, and through something called Catalyst 606. 
which features our Wednesday afternoon experiential learning and civic engagement block. Just this past week, last Wednesday, our experiential learning cohort, the Catalyst Semester, led by Andy Larson, visited Cabrini Green. Our cohort had the opportunity to connect with a young African-American man named Shaq, who grew up there. He guided our students over to a closed-down section of the housing project, with windows long shuttered. He spoke to our students about how the city made empty promises to residents and lamented there are 100,000 people on the wait list for affordable housing units the city said it would build in its place. As Shaq spoke, current residents of what is left of Cabrini walked by our group smiling and bantering with him. They stopped to say hello to our students, offering hospitality, telling jokes, and a different window to what once stood there. When Shaq greeted the more recent transplants of the area walking by, the ones who occupied the million dollar condos down the street, not a single one responded or even looked at him. Our students knew exactly what was happening. At one point, Shaq stopped and asked our students, do you feel safe? The students laughed at his question. Of course they did. They did as much laughing as learning. Then he said something that stopped the current for a moment. A bunch of us are running a Just Say Hello campaign. We meet with our new neighbors to let them know what we're all about. We're not all thugs or gangbangers. At that moment, our students knew it was Shaq who wasn't safe. In his perspective, the new settlers have come in to remove people like him. They no longer use cannons, guns, or disease, but dollars and cents, or eminent domain. Afterwards, as we debriefed our time with him, I realized something profound happened in our students. And it spoke to me as I sat in my frustration. Although they suspected the waters were bound for lands of gold, as they stepped into the waters, they were still able to find traces of Eden in the river too. Traces of Eden like Shaq remind us to say hello in a polarized world where we simply look down and walk past each other. The same dehumanization that can often justify faster currents or polluting the waters instead of reversing them. As we begin a new journey under the leadership of President Surridge, until the currents change, or no matter how quickly the river flows, as Dr. Eden has reminded us, may we be reminded the waters of Eden still run through our campus, embody it in our own students, who inspire us with their own sense of the way things should be, pointing us to the headwaters of Eden. May their vision and optimism buoy us as we head upstream. As we know, changing the current will require innovation and the challenging of our natural risk aversion. Heaven, the new Jerusalem, is waiting on it. Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to thank Dr. Eden for uh, coming back to North Park and for all the work that you do. And I and also want to congratulate President Serge for um, her uh, official uh, celebrations uh, for this week, <laughs> uh, as well, and, and officially starting in the position. Uh, today, um, I want to encourage us to consider the intersection of biographies, history, place, and race, and then subsequently privilege in the work that we uh, do. Uh, W.E.B. Uh, du Bois uh, wrote that the problem of the 20th century is a problem of the color line, and we can carry that right on into the 21st century, unfortunately, uh, here in America. Um, and and uh, the history of this is carried into the present day, and we really should acknowledge uh, this and what it means. Like, we acknowledge biblical history, we acknowledge um, our ancestry, so acknowledging that history is important. Like, for instance, we are in the midst of Black History Month uh, here in America, but are we celebrating the achievements of blacks in America from the first successful open heart surgery to the gas mask to the home security system to the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or to everyday people like Candace Payne who pay for people to stay in hotels during the polar vortex here in Chicago where the temperatures reach negative 52 degrees. You know, out there. And when we think that some of the world's greatest technologies uh, and technological advances and social advances owe their origins to black inventors like Garrett Morris and um, Garrett, uh, Garrett Morgan and Louis Latimer and Daniel Hale Williams and even Marie uh, Van uh, Britton Brown. 
And I bring this up because often what we hear from well-meaning um, people and well-meaning uh, scholars is this flat view of blacks and Latinx populations and indigenous populations without an inclusion of the greatness accomplished in spite of housing segregation, in spite of lynchings, in spite of hyper-incarceration, in spite of uh, racial profiling, in spite of seeing your sons and your brother and your husband gunned down on the streets um, as well, right? And so our work in the city, I believe, should incorporate what it means for those who carry, absorb, and wrestle with the trauma of having their histories sanitized as well, because that ignores the consequences of the legacies of genocide, the legacies of ethnic cleansing, of slavery, of racialized illegality, as Garcia talks about, and being left out of an economy and of, with the segregated living, as Dr. Eden points out, and segregated learning. So I'm not suggesting focusing on the catastrophe, but to acknowledge the impact on the spirit. Right? Doing, not doing it really leaves our work mismanaged um, as well. So when we think about the conditions that Dr. Eden so beautifully noted uh, in her work and in some other work that she talked about today, it's important that we also remember that it's not just about the violence uh, and the inadequacies of public housing and all that went along with for those 100,000 uh, residents. Um, uh, in that area, but also the hyper-incarceration that she mentions and how the United States moved towards a carceral state in the 1970s right on the heels of civil rights legislation. The uh, impact of racial profiling, of white flight, and the psychology of people not wanting to live by you because that matters. Right of carceral citizenship that Reuben Miller and Stuart Forrest talked about in their work, right? The aesthetics of neglect, of what it looks like to have elevators out and no lights uh, in places and not have trash uh, picked up or, or not even have trash containers there to put your trash in and what that means, right? Of the environmental violence that uh, Robert Bullard talked about out of uh, Emory, of the transportation racism that I get at in my own work here uh, in Chicago, but even the savagery of the inequality quality of education that Jonathan Kozo gets at in his work, right? That yes, care for others and addressing people's material needs are so important because people need food, food and they need decent housing, but it can't be just about the care that makes us comfortable, which is what Dr. Eden talked about, but the care that acknowledges the catastrophic histories that are embodied in those who we are ministering to uh, because it leaves a mark just like sin leaves a mark in people's lives. That, so yes, I'm saying that it takes a lot to begin to even to do the job properly of ministry work. So no, we don't have to just sit around in the meantime um, because people need help, right? But I really encourage us to be mindful of getting of not getting so caught up in being good and doing good that we ignore the impact of sitting on the receiving end of external forces that impact your life, right? So sociology, and I'm a sociologist just like Dr. Eden and just like Provost Emerson, right? Uh, sociology really does understand, right, the suffering of racially marginalized uh, groups, right? But I'm not saying uh, we should focus on these burdens that I mentioned and not on the promise as my colleague, uh, Dr. Peter St. John talks uh, about, but that we can't ignore the embodiment of the burden, right, and how that gets passed down from generation uh, to generation. So uh, we should consider also the celebrations, right? What is the joy, what uh, about the joy and the thriving that happened in these same places where street violence may happen and where institutional violence happens? Where is that in showing up in our work, right? That these uh, flattened pictures of only impoverished without peril uh, of impoverishment without also a parallel um, and studies of black richness that happens in churches and happens in block parties is also problematic um, as well. Mary Patillo um, and some of her scholars uh, that she's working with look at like this black place making that happens and others are looking at Latinx place making um, that happens and it's important, right? And when Jesus, you know, uh, told us, you know, to come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest, that Jesus not only ministered to the poor, but he also dealt with people who started the problem, 
right at the same uh, time. And, and, and that Jesus said, like, you, you need to do something materially, but also spiritually, but you also have to teach people to have a do-right mind so they can stop creating the suffering that people are going through every day, and that needs to be part of it. And Paul got at that as well in his work. And I think that that's an important message that we can't just focus on um, the marginalized, but also those who are creating those marginal fringes, right? Those that push people out into the periphery. What are we doing for them, right? And so in responding to Dr. Eden's uh, work, I think about Camilla Charles's work on what, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And, and she did additional work with Lawrence uh, Bobo on people's racial attitudes and who they're willing uh, to live with, and also Massey and Denton's work, and other scholars that show that black and Latinx groups want to live in integrated spaces. Nobody wants to live with us. And that's where the problem lies. We need to deal with the why don't you want to live with us part of it. And that's an important part of Christian ministry because, you know, Jesus, there, there is no schism in the body of Christ, right? But God doesn't treat us different because we're, uh, whether we're free or we're in bondage, right? Whether we're Jew or whether we're Greek, right? We're all the same in the eyes of uh, God um, as well. And so Dr. Eden talks about the moving towards opportunity um, uh, thing that happened, and uh, my work, I have, I got a uh, part of the uh, grant uh, that I have from the institution, the professional development grant, where I'm looking at how black men don't even get to fully get a full dose of moving towards opportunity, that we can move people into different neighborhoods, but what happens when they come into integrated public spaces, right, and how risk reduction is still not there um, for them, but, but then they take that social aggression that they experience back into their neighborhoods, right, into neighborhoods that may have some joy in it, but these neighborhoods also have different types of institutional uh, violence and in some cases uh, street violence. Right, and so Dr. Eden's book on coming of age uh, in the other America gives some attention to this, but, but this, some reshaping of some of those uh, questions may have also led to some other things that you could find out um, with it. Like, what does it um, do to our psychological responses to plays? And Yi Fu Tuan, as well as Tony Hiss, talks about the fact that we have a physiological and a psychological response to plays. What has it done to the Cabrini Green, the Ida B. Wells, the Arkell Garden, and the Henry Horn home and the Robert Taylor home people to see, because home is a haven, and to see your haven implode. What has that done to people that even for all the violence that Cabrini Green had, if you talk to residents, they talk about, but it was still community. And to watch it literally get blown up. And what does that mean for them, even as they're in these new uh, neighborhoods and in these new uh, spaces as well, um, right? And so part of the uh, moving towards uh, opportunity and the great transformations, what Chicago called it, um, is that there was so much violence, and I don't mean street violence, I'm talking about institutional violence, institutional harm, um, but that the Christian heart and the Christian ministry, we can address that. All right, we can address that harm that people um, live through, that violence, and I'm not talking again about street violence, but the violence of poverty, the violence of racism, the violence of classism, and the violence of place, and not the physical violence, which, uh, again, to refer to my colleague, Dr. Peter St. John, talk about why isn't there more of that street violence in it, and, and to talk about um, peace. And Dr. Eden's work really recognizes the trauma of this violence, the trauma of the violence of poverty, of racism, of classism, and the violence um, of space, and living with those experiences, which then often also include parents who have been incarcerated or addicted to drugs, as she speaks about uh, in her work. So when we minister, shouldn't we then also think about how we are not only dealing with the things that people are wrestling with, but at the same time, in that ministry, are we celebrating the humanity of those that we are working with on a regular um, basis, but also to be aware with, as Dr. Eden's work shows, how people's dignities have been left fragile. And so I'm not suggesting um, only that our hearts become enlightened, but also that our mindsets uh, become enlightened so that it does move us towards something actually working, right? <laughs> the sociology of poverty. That's all I got for you today. All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we have 10 minutes. If you have burning questions, hand them out, uh, hand them down, write them down, hand them to the sides. Um, I want to ask the panel to think about this, a small question. So as Christians, what is our call 
to the city, to the metropolitan area, to the small town that we live in, as we live in the now, but not yet. If you could say one thing to us, to the audience, what is one call, one thing you wish that as Christians we would unite and start working on? I have one. So I'm, I just want to say that last time I gave a talk um, at North Park, it was with Michael and, and Michelle, and they completely, you know, I was like outstaged. So that just happened again. Amazing responses. Uh, but for what I heard uh, from the three of you is, um, you know, speaking the truth in love. We can't, we can't love without speaking the truth in love. And so part of our task is to is to finally and fully speak the truth. Thank you. That was actually going to be my same response. Oh. Proving we're sociologists. <laughs> 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 well, that's right. To live in and dwell in the spirit of truth in, in the work. And even if that truth makes us uncomfortable, um, if we love someone, we tell them the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're going to do things in love, we do them in truth. So I, I concur. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, really think of Wolf's work with um, exclusion and embrace. And the idea that um, one of the things that we are working on that Provost uh, mentioned is the idea that um, we're working with community partners in terms of how do we engage violence in our city. And so what this is is really a positive loitering initiative that really encourages the church to get out of its four walls and to really in some ways be present um, in visceral ways within their blocks. Um, the data is uneven in terms of how effective this is, but a lot of people at the table feel like this is the next strategic move for churches to engage this crisis in our city. And um, one of the things that they said is that this is across different networks, so this is a meta-network initiative, and they said that, you know, North Park, for, for you, you're a neutral ground, and the fact that you can embrace all of us, um, regardless of our denominational differences, our, our different perspectives, and because you are this place of higher learning, um, we see you as a place where we could come and, and, and engage. And so I feel like that's one of the things that we can offer to our city. I would say address mass incarceration. The church needs to do that. We lock up um, disproportionately people of color, um, people who are by and large mentally ill or were victims of sexual assault, people who are non-citizens, um, the people who are living in our most economically distressed neighborhoods. All of the people that Matthew 25, that Jesus' parable names, those are the people that we lock up. Um, we're locking up our inheritance. And um, if we could do one thing, it would be to address that. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some great questions here. We won't get them all, and I apologize, but we will get through a couple. So this question is pertaining to wondering about uh, public spaces and whether they can overcome segregation. So it says... Could a reinvestment in parks, libraries, and so on play a role in bridging our cultural divides? Well, since I do public spaces, right? <laughs> um, well, the work that I mentioned earlier that I have the um, North Park grant for, I'm actually studying the downtown parks in Chicago and how people are using the space. And even in places of leisure, um, African-American males don't have respite. Uh, in those same uh, areas. And we live in our neighborhoods longer th than we do anything else in parks. So if the neighborhoods remain uh, segregated, but if also we continue a public policy of everyone not being the public that is welcomed, mm -hmm. then, it, then there is a challenge there that uh, surveillance and policing um, have to change, but also the social surveillance and the social avoidance. But if you're raised segregated and you are only getting a single-sided narrative in your education, I think it was Harvard or Yale did a study that um, the more people read stories growing up by and about people of color, the more empathetic they are. Um, that we, there are so many ways, places where we have to change what we do to see the effects of it uh, in public spaces. But can it be done? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll direct this to Dr. Eden. Um, universal basic income is being proposed as a way to address poverty. Is there any evidence that this works? My dad just texted me about this the other day. He said, what do you think about UBI? I'm like, dad, cool. <laughs> so, um, I've done a, a, a lot of work that I didn't talk about here 
uh, with the poor, and I, you know, for 25 years, and I've come away, uh, as you mentioned, with the, um, I've drawn the conclusion that uh, what the poor seem to want more than anything else, and this is kind of striking, right? Uh, my book just before the one I showed you was about people living on less than $2 per person per day in America. And even those people, what they seem to want more than anything else uh, was a sense that they could contribute to the community. Uh, the shorthand for this is dignity, but it's really about wanting uh, to contribute to the community. How have we, how did we miss this? None of our public policies, our few of our outreach efforts pay attention to the fact that the people we serve can serve us and have something to contribute to us. So um, I, I've written a couple of books about this, uh, about social policies have meaning. And we have social policies uh, that tear down dignity, that literally strip people of their citizenships, such as the welfare system. But we have other uh, policies uh, like uh, tax credits. Uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit is the biggest anti-poverty program in our country by far, and I bet most of you have never heard of it. Uh, policies that build dignity and, and citizenship. And uh, it's not clear to me that the UBI will do that. Uh, it could ease, you know, it depends, a lot depends on the implementation. Uh, it would break the bank. It's unbelievably expensive. And so what I've advocated for instead is a, uh, a universal child allowance, an expanded allowance that will get more income into the hands of every working parent. Uh, all you have to do is, uh, is earn a dollar in order to get the credit the way we've, uh, we've designed it. And it would be especially generous uh, to parents of uh, preschool kids so they could get those kids the high quality child care or elect uh, to stay home and, and parent their children uh, as they're very young. Uh, so there are trade-offs, but um, the benefit of a child allowance is that um, people feel they earned it because uh, they had to work, <laughs> you know, and, and file a tax return. Uh, in order to get it. Now, you might say, well, that's exclusionary. Of, of course, it's got problems. Uh, but people, uh, you know, it's striking to me how uh, everyone hates charity, but especially people in need, uh, because they want to contribute and they want to be treated as if they have, have something valuable uh, to contribute. So I would say uh, there are other ways, more targeted ways, to really lift up uh, the poor. Now, who gets left out of this? Men. I've written a lot about this as well, um, and I believe that every father who's working in paying child support ought to have that same benefit. 20% of men aren't dads. You know, we'll have to have that conversation, but uh, that would be what I would recommend. Okay. Let me make this the last question, and it's a challenge to us. So, Chicago, as you showed us in your graphs, became more and more diverse, but also more segregated. This question is basically saying North Park has that challenge as well, right? That as far as we may have come, we've become diverse, but we still have our challenges with segregation that you might see in the dining hall, the chapel, the residence halls. Um, maybe I'll ask the, the three panelists and just one or two of you could answer. Um, what would you suggest? How could we make progress on that as a university? Are students still in the room? <laughs> um, I, in the years that I've been at North Park, one of the, I think, the lessons I've drawn from first being in student engagement and now um, in academic affairs under the provost um, is that the students can really lead us. I believe that the more student-centered we are as an institution, the more that we can really hear and create spaces where they can foster these conversations. Sometimes they take the conversation to places where I don't want to go um, and they're uncomfortable. But the thing that I love is that I have so many, I've built up so many of these, these mechanisms that in some ways inoculate me from really getting into those issues that, that are really necessary and needed. And so I feel like, I know this is kind of an easy way out, but, but I really do believe that if the more student-centered we are as an institution, in my opinion, I feel like they can really lead us actually to, towards that end. So students, take that as a challenge. 
with an administrator standing up here, proposed to us a way to reduce the segregation on our campus. Talk about it amongst yourselves and propose it, and let's see if we can enact it. Let us give a hearty welcome and thank you to our panelists and our speaker. We're grateful to all of you. Now we invite you to walk over and follow the crowd and uh, to the reception over at the Johnson Center. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>